Oh, I have something to okay. add to this. Okay, go ahead. You're gonna surprise me, so I thought I'd surprise you. I'm Vivian Edwards. I'm an assistant research scientist and I work on carbon products, particularly coal to carbon products and uh, critical minerals. Well, my research is currently focused on conversion of coal to graphite and carbon fiber. And that research involves turning coal into a liquid through coal liquefaction and then processing that coal liquid into a coal tar pitch or a coal pitch and that coal pitch is then heat treated into the precursors for either carbon fiber or into a graphite that can be used in batteries. We don't really think about coal in terms of products other than burning it but graphite is a huge component of lithium ion batteries so everyone is carrying some graphite on them whether they know it or not in their phone and Kentucky as a whole is moving towards being one of the largest vehicle battery manufacturers in the country. And so using our resources to create these electric vehicles is a sustainable goal for our natural resources in this state compared to say burning that. So in Kentucky, we have the Eastern Kentucky coal field and the Western Kentucky coal field. And we are sitting on the Cincinnati arch in between, which is made out of limestone. That's where all of our caves are. Kentucky is important and CAR is at a unique advantage because we have access to calls from both the Appalachian Basin to the east and the Illinois Basin to the west, meaning that we have access to two of the most economically important coal basins in the country for our research. So generally when you heat coal in absence of oxygen, what you get is coke. Now with coal liquefaction, we have something present like hydrogen gas or a hydrogen donor solvent that is stabilizing that intermediate phase so that the coal does not become a coke. That's fundamentally what coal liquefaction is about. This is a more stable, more environmentally friendly application for the technology. Coal is formed from plants. In our case, it's formed from Carboniferous era plants. He's actually more related to today's pine trees. Anyway, his time is up and he falls over into the water. Now, because he's under this water, the oxygen and microbes can't really reach him to break him down. And as time goes on, he gets buried under layers of soil under that water. Now, over the course of 300 to 350 million years, with a lot of heat, metamorphism, like a metamorphic rock happens to him. And that starts the coalification process, turning him into coal. So now after millions of years, we have this nice lump of coal here. Now, coal is very complex. It's mostly made of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen. And the structure itself can get quite wild, as you can see here, this is just one example of what a piece of coal might look like. Now, in our case, I have our coal lumps here and they're bound by this carbon-carbon bond. As we heat up to about 400 degrees C, we're going to get carbon-free radicals breaking that bond up. Now, these free radicals, you might've heard of them in the case of antioxidants at your grocery store claiming to deal with free radicals in the body. Now, you wanna deal with them because they're very reactive maybe milliseconds in terms of their life. Now, if we just let this go, what'll happen is we'll get coke, which is a foamy black rock that we can use to make steel. But if we give a source of hydrogen radicals, our superhero here, those hydrogen radicals will stabilize our carbon radicals and we get a liquid that then we can then filter out the chunks from and use in our process. After I have made the coal liquid and gotten it out of the reactor, it will be filtered 
And after it's filtered, sometimes it will come back to me and I will do a vacuum distillation. Then after the vacuum distillation, it will move on to a heat treatment step where we heat it up to about 400 degrees C for hours. If we're lucky, that resulting solid will be useful for spinning carbon fibers. Or if it's not, we take it over and we use it to make graphite at 2700 degrees Celsius. From there, we will use it to make batteries and test those, those pseudo batteries. My name is David Eaton. I am a, uh, trained as an organic chemist. I have a lot of industrial experience and I work as a research program manager for the, uh, the center. So I was friends with Dave's son and when I was working on my final paper for my undergraduate degree after going back to school, I found out that his father was a chemist and so I asked him to look at my final paper. And it just so happened to be in an area that we're intimately familiar with, so I was happy to look at it. And uh, after I looked at it, I realized it was as good as anything I had assigned uh, as a um, task for, say, a graduate student or an advanced undergraduate. So I knew that this person was on the ball and careful. And we started to discuss chemistry and the kind of research that was going on here, and it really piqued my interest. And I had been discussing having an assistant for years, basically since I got here. And he offered to help me get a temp job here. And I realized once I had gotten here that I really liked the center and I wanted to work here. And it worked out better than I could have imagined. She's very organized, very driven. The other, the other thing was that this friendship that she had with my son blossomed. And so over the course of time, they, they ended up getting, getting married. And so according to nepotism rules, she can no longer be my direct employee. And anybody can tell you that uh, my career has taken a steadily downturn. No, not really. <laughs> but uh, I do miss having her directly in my chain of command because we work uh, very well together. I think the most exciting thing about working with Dave is his love for students and teaching. The wonder showing them the stuff that we do here. You know, as a scientist, sometimes things that are amazing can seem mundane. Something interesting like liquid nitrogen or dry ice to get people excited about science and excited about the world. Um, Dave excels at that and it's great to see. At, now that, you know, we've, uh, we've become family, you know, and uh, that's um, really important to me. And there's a deep bolus of trust that was uh, created at work, but has extended through family. And that, uh, you know, it's about as good as it can get. You know, working at CAR really made me think about what kind of research do I want to do? And this sort of energy research that is tackling active problems in the world, it, it, I feel like what I'm doing matters. And CAR is giving me the opportunity to go to grad school and uh, get a master's in geology. And eventually I'm going to go and get a PhD. I think what I really like about the center is the interdisciplinary nature of it. So I'm a chemist and I will go talk to an engineer and a machinist and then go and consult with a geologist. And someone once told me the highest impact science is interdisciplinary science. And everything we do here is interdisciplinary. Energy is something that we need on a daily basis and these problems are not easily solved. It's not as simple as never taking coal or oil out of the ground anymore. The isopropanol in your cabinet, uh, your drywall, for example, these are things that could be made from coal or petroleum that we don't necessarily think of. But with collaboration and teamwork and effort, we can solve those problems and I wanna be a part of that. So when I first came to the center, one of the things that I was assigned was working with these coal tar pitch samples, these coal pitch samples, 
on the microscope to determine whether or not they were suitable for spinning into carbon fiber. And in the process, I met Jim Hauer, and we just started to discuss coal. And at the time, I didn't know that Jim Hauer is one of the most important coal scientists on the continent. His openness to discussing things, to teaching me, to showing me how to identify the varying mass rolls in coal under a microscope um, just really piqued my interest in geology. The flying spaghetti monster, everything has been touched by his noodly appendage. Uh, I'm an ordained minister of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. I, they gave me a little holographic card and it says I can uh, officiate weddings, last rites, and throw out false prophets of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Trigger warning. This scene will contain spiders. While we respect those who love these creatures, we realize some, including the producer of this video, may experience some psychological harm during these scenes. Viewer discretion is advised. So I've always been a bit of a bug person. When I was a kid, I would get in trouble because I would just pick up bugs and put them on my mom. She didn't like that, obviously. But I've never really been afraid of spiders. I've always been kind of fascinated by spiders. So once I got my first tarantula, which was a uh, Mexican red knee tarantula, like the one from Home Alone, it just became sort of a obsession to get more of them because they're, they're not really doing a lot and they don't eat that much. So managing 11 of them is uh, not too difficult. The one we're gonna meet today, Banana, is a Gramostola pulchropes, also known as a Chaco Golden Knee Tarantula. And she is a baby. She's probably about four years old. It will probably be about another four years before she's fully grown. At that point, she'll probably be about the size of my hand. She's a very docile tarantula. She is not a good eater, doesn't eat that often. And she just got into a new enclosure. She just grew a little bit and got moved up to a bigger enclosure. Uh, I really like theme parks. I think my favorite theme park was Cedar Point, riding the, the top thrill dragster and the Millennium Force. We're planning a trip to Dollywood next year and I, I'm really excited to ride the, uh, the Bear Mountain roller coaster. You're gonna surprise me, so I thought I'd surprise you. <laughs> what? Are we gonna do this at and try to catch me off guard, so I'll catch you. I love it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. I think I'd have to go with Wolverine because regeneration just seems like the coolest superpower to me. Um, my favorite meme is probably the Mr. Krabs confused meme where he's getting surrounded by people who are upset with the pretty patty. I would be a bread maker. You know, bread making is pretty precise. You gotta get the ingredients just right or the bread won't rise or work. So I think that's where it fits. I'm a visual learner. I would much rather watch a YouTube video to learn something. I mean, Socrates being the smartest guy in Athens didn't really work out for him, so I think I'd be the richest. I'd rather see a play. I really like Hamlet and Macbeth and Shakespearean tragedy. History Museum, I want to see some old artifacts. On the count of three, say the first word that comes to your head. One, two, three. Pilk. Okay, what is pilk? Pepsi and milk. 